there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. According to ancient Greek myth, Zeus has a son named Heracles, born of a mortal woman. Zeus is very fond of Heracles and wants him to become divine. He therefore places the child on the breast of his wife, the goddess Hera, as she lay sleeping so the baby could nurse from her sacred milk. Hera wakes to find an unknown infant suckling at her breast. Surprised, she unlatches the baby, spraying her milk across the heavens, creating the Milky Way. she gets on and you feel that's a good latch mm -hmm. and just to kind of do a head to toe assessment okay. to make sure that every part of your body is relaxed. Okay. Relaxed. Each mother has a completely unique experience. Every mother has a story. And I've been working in pediatrics for 30 years. My first 10 years was at Children's Hospital working in an infectious disease ward. I studied child development as a background prior to that. Then I joined a practice with Dr. Jay Gordon where I am the nurse there and for the last 15 years I've been also their lactation consultant. Our pediatric practice is a, a breastfeeding practice. It's a well baby practice. The heart of, of pediatrics should be nutrition and the foundation for good nutrition is breastfeeding. In the last 10 years as a lactation consultant, what I have seen over and over is how many women have so much misinformation about what it is to be at ease with breastfeeding. It seems like it's become the most complicated, difficult thing when it shouldn't be. Babies have been born put on the mother's chest at birth. Babies did a natural crawl up to the breast and breastfed all by themselves. Why have we complicated this so much? Since Adam and Eve, since the first cavemen, since the very beginning of what we know, babies have been taken care of in a certain way. Throughout history, artists depicted the mother and child breastfeeding, mothering all over the world. The nursing mother was significant. We can single out very famous artists who represented the theme, from Leonardo da Vinci to El Greco, and later examples by people like Marie Cassatt and Pablo Picasso. In less than one century, the iconography of the nursing mother faded away. The first commercial milk pasteurizers were produced in 1882. In the late 1800s, when pasteurization became much more available and easy to do, certain companies like Nestle and Carnation decided they would come up with a formula that would substitute for breast milk. Someday, the new baby will play with Big Brother's toys. Might even inherit that precious baseball glove. But the formula he grows on must be his own exclusively. All babies are different. That's why hospitals send more babies home on formulas made with pet evaporated milk than on any other form of milk. We'll come up with a very special formula for your special baby, your unique baby. No baby gets the same thing. That's how it got its name, because the doctors would come up with the special ingredients for your baby. 
So they were able to convince women that this was much better than their breast milk. In 1945, at the end of World War II, most babies were bottle fed. Here's mommy, darling, don't cry. One of the things that prompted this was the war, the Great War, and women were going to work as Rosie the Riveter. My grandmother was one of those, and my mother was bottle-fed, consequently. But that was the new thing because it freed up women. By 1956, U.S. breastfeeding rates had dropped to 20%. In the 50s, we as culture, the Western culture, we start selling things that were totally unrelated to breasts, such as beer, cars, cigarettes, with large breasts. Women with large breasts exposing themselves, standing there, selling merchandise, and voila, it was sold. By the late 1950s, predominant attitudes were that nursing was disgusting and for the uneducated and lower classes. Doctors openly discouraged it. I asked my doctor, my gynecologist, about breastfeeding. I wanted to be prepared. And he looked at me as if I was crazy and said, breastfeeding? He said, why would you want to do that? You're not a cow. I didn't question anything. I didn't question it. By the 1960s, Formula companies increased their marketing campaigns, especially in developing countries. In 1977, the Nestle boycott began. Would you agree with me that your product should not be used where there is uh, impure water? We give all the instructions. Just, just, to just answer. What would you? What of is your position? Of course not. But we cannot not. cope with that. As I understand, what you say is where there's impure water, it should not be used. Yes where the people are so poor that they're not going to realistically be able to continue to purchase that, and which is going to mean that they're going to dilute it to a point yes. which is going to endanger the health, that it should not be used. Yes. Do you feel that you have any responsibility? We can't have that responsibility, sir. May I make a reference to... Uh, you can't have that responsibility? No, no, no. Meanwhile, the women's liberation movement was in full swing. I look at breastfeeding as a very feminist issue, and many of the feminists have ignored it because they look at the fight that went on in the early 70s of being able to put aside the fact that we get pregnant and that we have babies and breastfeed and that interrupts work. And we've been fighting to say, we're just as good as men. Don't consider us weak or less than. So they look at breastfeeding as bioessentialism. And what that means is just that since you can have babies, you must have babies. But my view is that, yeah, we're different. We need to look at our differences. And rather than trying to squeeze us into this established male model, let's change the model. We have performed a great social experiment. We don't birth the same way anymore, and we don't feed babies the same way anymore, and we don't relate and care for babies the way we used to. A lot of the messages you have have a commercial intent, and the commercial intent is you're not adequate until you buy XYZ or wear this or consume that. And there's a profit motive. There's a reason why this message keeps being sent out. And I think, I think that we have, uh, in America, might have stopped questioning that, that motive. Breastfeeding is symbolic, in a way, to all sorts of other things that create the attachment of human beings, the bonding of human beings, which in itself is the basis of culture. If you don't get that right, the culture begins to fragment. It's the connection, the physical connection, as well as an emotional connection. And one of the things that we really want to make clear is that women can trust themselves. They can trust their body, and they can trust their babies. Chantal is my mentor and my best friend. We've known each other for over 30 years. Together, Chantal and I want to normalize breastfeeding in America. We want to see a cultural shift and restore the nursing mother to a place of honor. 
we've developed a unique way of working with mothers. Our goal is to make sure a mother is confident with the tools and knowledge she needs to trust herself and her baby. Why is America's breastfeeding success rate so low? And what are we going to do to solve this growing crisis? We need some answers, and we need to turn this around. So what are the issues? First of all, what are breasts really for? Look at them so soft, so juicy. Roast spurt smoothie, give me them boobies. Ah, instinctive, never bite hard when I'm digging my teeth in. Teeth in, got me sleeping like a baby, safely. All I think about lately is your love. I need it. Everybody Women says... see their own breasts as sexual um, features of their body, but so are lips, and we use those for kissing and eating, and so are all sorts of other parts of our bodies can be multifunctional. There's so much pressure on me, and I think on women in general, to have sexuality be the forefront of what I present, and, and the question was begged, who would I be without that? That image, that positive image of the nursing mother has dropped out of our visual world. We see lots of images of sexualized breasts on TV, on the internet, but the image of a lactating breast is somehow unusual. Breastfeeding, I understand people want people to breastfeed. You can't breastfeed premature babies. That is for the parents to decide and the doctor. The government should blame. Michelle out. Obama now promoting breastfeeding as part of her campaign to fight childhood obesity. But you better breastfeed your babies because I, I'm looking, I'm going, yeah, you better because the price of milk is so high right now. Breastfeeding a baby is an intimate act. And it should be done privately, like farting or masturbating or pissing. Do you see where some people may be uncomfortable? Another breastfeeding conversation. Controversy. The moms say the lifeguard on duty blew his whistle and ordered them to stop breastfeeding. They said that we were publicly exposing ourselves. It's yeah. creepy. To me, that's creepy. With a lot of pressure on women to breastfeed. Giselle Bunchen. she now wants a law that would force all moms to breastfeed their babies for six months. <laughs> Give me advice on how to keep my teeth white, but shut up. Now, with all due respect to the beautiful Giselle, shut up and model. <laughs> People equate nursing to just feeding a baby. 10% of what goes on at the breast is about nutrition. 90% of what is happening is the laying down of the synapses of the brain, and the development of that human brain of an infant. It's growing at a phenomenal rate. Breastfeeding is fascinating because it's not just the milk, it's the smell, the, 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 the comforts, the, the feelings, the attachment with the uh, child, with the, with the mother, and the mother's forming of the habits with the child. The interaction that goes on in that very early period is absolutely vital to developing the central nervous system. In the earliest stages of a baby's life, 100 billion neurons are formed in the brain, nearly as many as there are stars in the Milky Way. Like no other time in a person's life, skin to skin ignites the neurons. And if they are not activated, the neurons are lost forever. The mother releases those bonding chemicals every time that baby is even snuggled next to her breast, but particularly while he suckles. From the mother's perspective, there's all of this uh, biochemical encouragement to bond to that baby, to love that baby, to protect that baby with her life if necessary. My son Mordecai and I have this very sweet and relaxed feedback loop between us. I know when he needs to go to the bathroom. I know when he needs to eat, to sleep. When a baby breastfeeds, there's a control that's set called the apostat, where a baby knows that food's always available. Don't eat any more than you need. If you're hungry 10 minutes later, someone's going to feed you. Start and stop as you feel like it. That ability to regulate your intake of calories and of food that can stick with you your whole life. 
It just has to be set during those early months where we say to a baby, eh, food, don't worry about it. If you don't finish what you want right now, we'll, we'll feed you a little more later. Breast milk is full of the mother's immunities, immunities that come from the baby exposing the mother. That's one of my favorite things. If, if a baby is exposed to something, a virus or a bacterium, and the mother isn't exposed, the baby's saliva will change. And when he goes to breast, he will signal the mother to begin to make antibodies for that thing that he was exposed to that she was not. Mothers have everything that they need to provide for their babies. Their breasts make a product that is so in tune with their baby that if you have a premature baby, it makes special milk for your premature baby. It's specifically created for your baby. Breast milk doesn't go from a baby's mouth to the esophagus to the stomach all day long. It goes up a baby's nose, out the baby's nose, uh, it goes retrograde up the eustachian tube, and wherever breast milk goes, it sterilizes the tubes. We would think it very strange if animals suddenly quit breastfeeding and handed, somehow handed their babies a bottle or some artificial feeding, yet we're doing it regularly. We are flooded with the message, breast is best, especially from formula companies. The Gerber generation knows that breastfeeding is the best way to naturally protect your baby. The routine formula designed to help avoid common feeding problems like fussiness, crying, and gas. What it does is create a question whether or not breast is best or formula is best or fine or whatever. And if you throw that question up there, then it, it's, it's under question. It, there is a question over what is better. That's what the formula companies want. I had heard about a blogger, the Fearless Formula Feeder and I was curious to find out more about her. I discovered that she was a mom who often felt alienated by breastfeeding mothers. I wasn't fearless. I was anything but fearless. I, wrote, I was writing it because I had so much fear and so much guilt and so much stress. The fact is that everybody was struggling. We're all trying as new moms and they were all trying to figure it out. And of course they had a right to feel proud. And of course they had a right to be talking about the benefits of breastfeeding and why formula is so bad because that was part of their narrative, you know? But I think nobody stopped to think like, well, you know, she's sitting there with the bottle. How does that make her feel? The other day, I was in a store, and I was coming out of the dirty, dark bathroom. As I was walking out, there was a mother walking right past me towards the bathroom with her newborn. And I said, oh, where are you going? That baby looks really hungry. And she said, oh, I'm going to feed my baby. I said, where are you going? And she goes, I'm going into the bathroom. I said, oh, no, you're not. <laughs> I took her, I said, here, I'm going to find you a nice, comfortable place to nurse up in the front of the store. Follow me. My child is three months old. We were kicked out of a store uh, in Venice, California, of all places. We were asked to leave, and, um, and we did. had dinner with my husband, and some friends were there, and somebody made a comment about me nursing my baby there, and you couldn't see anything and made a comment about, you know, babies aren't supposed to be at restaurants, they need to be at home with the nanny. And I remember at the time just being like, oh, you're so sensitive too when you're nursing. I sort of got the impression with the rather pinched expressions on these women's faces that they were sort of, you know, even though they couldn't really see it, they knew that my boob was exposed on some level when I was sort of feeding a baby. I was at a museum. At the time, my daughter was about 18 months. She was tired and wanted to nurse, so I sat down and, and nursed my child to avoid a tantrum in this, this particular exhibit, which was, which was a very quiet place. And um, I was asked to cover up. I mean, I've even had friends of mine 
you've been told that, you know, that's disgusting or, you know, they'll be looked at like, how could you possibly do something like that? And it's, it's so bizarre because in this culture, you know, you sexualize breasts and that's okay. But if you're actually doing what they're meant to do, then somehow it's like wrong. Thankfully, I have two children, and I know I'm doing the best thing for my baby, so I don't care what you think. But there are a lot of new moms who might be teetering on the edge of, do I really want to do this? Can I do this? And your dirty look might be the thing that makes her give up on herself. I was out to dinner. I was told to cover up. Hey, I was shopping, and I was told to cover up. Can they do this? Many women, many employers don't know the law, that we have a law that protects us. We can nurse wherever we need to nurse. When my lovely wife and I became pregnant, uh, we, like most parents, ran to the bookstores to read about how to become the most perfect parents one could. And after reading all of these works, my wife, who is also an anthropologist, were led to one of two conclusions. Either everything we had learned about human development, the evolution of human behavior, parenting, and infancy was fallacious coming out of anthropology, or all of the recommendations made by Western pediatricians as to how best to care for infants had really nothing to do with babies at all and were really based on more recent cultural Western ideologies. Doctors, the medical professionals, have taken over where mothers used to have a knowledge that they shared. It was a collective knowledge. They passed it on to their daughters, their granddaughters. Even lactation consultants, my associates, are inconsistent. She asked me what color his stools were and all this. She goes, oh, okay, well, it looks like we're four days behind. <laughs> so already, uh, before I even got the referral, she, this other lactation consultant told me that I wasn't doing well enough yet. I was behind. Women come to me lacking the support, the knowledge, the experience of being able to trust themselves and being able to trust their babies. I think that the support uh, through breastfeeding is crucial, having uh, the right information, the right tools. When you try to succeed at breastfeeding and you fail, it's, it's, it's emotionally really destroying. And it nearly happened to me, <laughs> and it happened to my sister, it happened to many women I know who are close to me. And it's not, it's not because physically they weren't able to do it, but they potentially don't have the support. Your first assignment as a mom is to feed your baby. To feel like you're failing at the first assignment is heartbreaking and really difficult. All you want to do is rise to the occasion. I was so freaked out that I wasn't doing anything right. And it, the most basic thing I needed to do was make sure that he was fed. I could hold him and I could, I could talk to him, but, and I knew that I was doing that OK, but I wasn't sure that the feeding was working, but I, I knew that I could look at a bottle at least and tell that it was, he was drinking it. Without a supportive employer and paid maternity leave, the nursing mother is challenged even more. We don't want to create an environment where having to choose between your paycheck and the health of your child becomes um, a decision that a mother has to make at a really vulnerable time. When women have longer leaves, they breastfeed more. The saddest thing for me, and I don't think I'll ever get over it, is that I had to go back to work. I had to leave my child at three months of age. I know he was grieving for me. I was grieving for him. And yet everyone around me told me, well, that's normal. He'll be OK. Listen, he'll stop crying as soon as you leave. He'll be fine. He wasn't fine. I think if women had the support and they were able to stay home with their little ones, I think that they would choose to do that. But, you know, if you don't have the choice, what are you going to do? There are only four countries in the world with no government-mandated paid maternity leave. And the United States is one of them. We expect women to come back to work right after they've had a baby 
and we expect them to resume the life that they led before. We have the Civil Rights Act, and the Civil Rights Act protects women who are pregnant, and it's sex discrimination if we discriminate against them if they are pregnant. However, it doesn't cover lactation. And so, in fact, all of the U.S. case law around lactation in the workplace opines that there is no connection between pregnancy and lactation. So employers across the United States have the right to fire a woman if she's breastfeeding, and there is no real case law recourse. You're not being paid maternity leave and you have to go back to work. It makes it a lot harder to, to keep breastfeeding. I think that our society looks at mothering as a compartmentalized part of life. And I think the thing that's happened, and I, I think it's a very difficult situation that women are in, is that women want to have careers and they want to have children. And the reality for me was that I couldn't do both the way that I wanted to do it. We force women back to work here so quickly and they go into to mothering thinking that they're not gonna be able to be successful. And it's a shame because we're all just, we're losing out on this once in a lifetime experience. Right after birth, separation of the baby from the mom is one of the most damaging interventions that professional medicine has come up with. When a mother has her baby in the hospital, um, it's the way that she's treated in the hospital that's gonna make a big difference on whether or not she'll be able to breastfeed. My gut was saying like, no, something's off, something's off. I know this isn't supposed to work this way. Um, but you know, no one seemed to listen. And I felt like, well, I've never had a baby. You know, these people know what they're doing. Hospitals make money if a baby is readmitted with an illness. They really don't make money if a baby is healthy. And they actually consider the neonatal intensive care unit, the pediatric unit, they consider the babies in those units as a product line. Employers across the United States have the right to fire a woman. There's really nothing to do with babies at all. Yeah, we're doing it right You've been told that, you know, that's disgusting. That's bioessential. And what that means is just that since you can, you like really want to must have to be done privately, like farting or masturbating. The obstacles are overwhelming. I was beginning to wonder how one person, how I, could really help make a difference. Chantal and I spoke about the challenges that so many women face in America. She reminded me about the breastfeeding practices in some of the European countries. She visited a hospital in Berlin a few years ago and told me about some of the amazing things they were doing with their tiniest babies in the NICU as well as their full-term babies. Many of these countries have higher success rates with breastfeeding and we decided we had to find out why. What are they doing right? Today we are headed to St. Joseph Hospital in Berlin, Germany. They are a certified baby-friendly hospital with an extremely high breastfeeding rate. They were the first baby-friendly children's hospital in the world. The biggest thing of baby-friendly hospitals is that they don't make so many mistakes in the beginning of life. 97% of full-term babies and 86% of premature babies leave St. Joseph exclusively breastfed. The Baby Friendly Hospital Initiative was launched in 1991 as an effort by UNICEF and the World Health Organization to increase breastfeeding rates worldwide. Dr. Abadakan explains to me how they used to do things before they went baby friendly. 
we look very good for the medicine, but we don't look what happens between mother and child and with mother, child and father. Uh, we did separate them in this time. And so we make many, many mistakes in the beginning of contact. It's easy to understand why breastfeeding rates are decreasing in this time, because they don't get the chance to get the natural way between, between mother and child. Katrin Bausch established the baby-friendly program at St. Joseph Hospital's neonatal intensive care unit. But she did more than just initiate a program that supports breastfeeding. Katrin created a unit where every mother stays in the same room with her baby for the entire time that baby needs to be in the hospital. Katrin explained to us how important it is to keep very ill and even dying babies with their mothers and fathers. It's something good also for the fourth family that uh, the baby doesn't, isn't alone. Yes, to dying, it's always in contact with the family. She then took us to meet a mother who had recently lost one of her twins. She's doing good, though. She's yeah. They said 33 she's weeks. She's 33 yeah. weeks. Yeah. We are not the most important person for the baby, whose baby syndrome we like to say. Whose baby syndrome? I've never heard of that. What does it mean? Nurses and also the doctors think it's their baby. They know what is the best for the baby, and the parents are absolutely incompetent. And then the parents think they are incompetent, they get fear of, of their baby. And it's a terrible situation, especially for the parents. We get staff who wants to play with the babies. Some of my gray hair come from the fight against them. They like to, to wrap the babies, they like to feed the babies with a bottle. So we have to change the idea of those nurses. They have to be the experts staying behind the mothers. I remember the nurse giving it to her yeah. to me, mm -hmm. and I was really a bit scared. Yeah. Actually, I said, oh, no, 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 don't, because I was so afraid I could break her. She was just so small, had that little breathing mask on. Me, the nurse said, no, 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 she really needs you now. She's, she's afraid as well, and she thinks no one is there for her. So take her, take her and make her feel that mommy's there, and. So I thought, OK, OK, OK. Immediately, everything was fine. The mother is here 24 hours a day, takes care of her own baby 24 hours a day, changing diapers, washing, temperature control. And also, she learns to read her baby. She learns to see um, what wants my baby to tell me, is it now? lonely, does it want to be carried, is it hungry, does it want to drink. What happens is that the mother gets more confidence in her own. Uh, I am important for my baby. I can, can give my baby things a nurse can't give. I was totally surprised by how the staff at St. Joseph trust the parent. In the United States, it's the complete opposite. Doctors and nurses routinely take control away from mothers and fathers. In medical school, they don't teach us a lot about breastfeeding, and they also don't teach us that much about interacting with parents. What we do is we learn how to take care of sick kids. We don't learn a lot about wellness. We don't learn a lot about well baby care. Medical professionals have taken the stand that, oh no, we know best for your baby and you need to listen to us. Something that has happened to our culture um, kind of slowly and subtly over the last 50 or 75 years is kind of an erosion of the uh, valuing the importance of that mother-baby relationship and the importance of the mother herself.
The mother is not only less valued in the United States, but parents are discouraged from questioning hospital policies. In many cases, parents actually have their babies taken away. Anna Nikolaev reached out to us after police went into her home last night. They were there with CPS. Anna says this whole thing started with a trip to the hospital and her need for a second opinion on her baby boy's condition. It's a charge that baffles both Anna and her husband. It seems like the parents have no right whatsoever. One local couple says their baby was kept in the hospital against their will after a nurse called social services. He said, well, if you would leave the hospital, I would have to arrest your husband. Celia is referring to the police officer who was sent to her room just hours after she gave birth all because she and her husband told a nurse that they didn't want to keep Lilia overnight in the NICU to be treated for jaundice. Basically, you're going to take the baby and put her in that incubator no matter what. All of these messages that women receive in our culture create doubt and fear and undermine a mother's intuitive knowledge of her baby. I see this so often with the mothers I work with. They are terrified and feel as though they are failing as mothers. We give the mother the chance to take the baby by herself, put it on her skin, and then we have time for mother and the baby. After one or two hours, the baby will move to the breast by themselves. A baby needs time to crawl to the breast and latch on. Of all the mammals, of all the primates, the human infant is neurologically the least mature at birth than any other primate. Its own nervous system expects to engage to create a what's called a microenvironment that would protect and buffer this extremely vulnerable infant. It's absolutely vital to self-regulation, to health, to the immune system, to the nervous system, and to all layers of the bee. Even the preemie should be put on the mother's chest after birth. This is called kangaroo mother care. The baby stays in skin-to-skin -skin contact with the mother most of the day and night. When they're together, mother and child, respiration is getting better, the oxygen and skin is getting better, the eating, drinking from the baby is getting better. It's much more difficult when they're put in an incubator with all our high technology compared to right on the mother's chest where that baby is already programmed to relax. My baby was born one day shy of 27 weeks. I didn't see him right after he was born. He was whisked off to the NICU. There were a lot of people in the room. I probably got to hold him maybe five days after he was born. I was pregnant with twins. Uh, I delivered at 36 weeks. I had a C-section. They gave me Chloe and Tao for maybe a few minutes. I don't think even a few minutes, and then they took them away. And Chloe had to go under observation. Uh, I think she, her breathing was a little bit questionable, but she was fine, and Tao was fine. Um, and I didn't really see them for hours after that. There are people there to take care of your baby. They encourage you to go home and get rest, so you'll be rested up when the baby does come home. So if you are a little different, then you kind of stick out like a sore thumb if you do want to be there. All they have is just standard chairs, so they got a a bigger chair that led up for me. So you had to sleep there in a chair? I had to sleep at the NICU in a chair. Yes, I did. 
separating babies from their mothers is unique to the 20th and 21st centuries. When they cut the cord and put the baby off in the warmer and stimulate it, what they call it, to get it to cry, that actually puts the baby into distress, into survival mode. It has to try to take care of itself on its own. With my son, uh, he was a, an emergency C-section delivery. Uh, it was horrible. I mean, I saw him briefly when he was born, but he was all wrapped up and all I saw were these little, you know, his like eyes and nose. And it was like, here's your son. <laughs> and then he was gone. They whisked him off to, I guess, you know, test him, bathe him, whatever they were gonna do with him. Overall, I just felt very removed and, and like something very foreign had just happened. I don't even remember holding him for several hours. I don't, I know that I didn't have skin to skin with him until at least the second day. It just was all very hazy and I didn't feel very in control of what was going on. It felt like I wasn't really there. The baby's biophysical response to his environment changes when he's not in her arms. Everything is different during separation. Dr. Louise Dumas has done extensive research on the effects of separation and skin-to-skin -skin care of babies immediately after birth. There's something going on within those two first hours, and we call it a sensitive period because the babies that have been separated don't behave the same way. The mothers don't behave the same way with those babies, and the babies don't react the same way. The American Academy of Pediatrics recognizes the benefits of skin-to-skin -skin and actually recommends it as hospital policy, yet it is definitely not the norm. Why would the American Academy of Pediatrics recommend immediate skin-to-skin, -skin, but not make sure it is enforced in all hospitals? It's interesting to note that a lot of our practice seems to be out of convenience rather than science. We talk a lot about evidence-based practice and how important it is to have science behind the things that we teach and the things that we do. And yet, to my knowledge, there is no scientific evidence anywhere that says that it's good, healthy, okay, for a mother and her baby to be separated. It's fundamental physiology. Contact changes the clinical direction of a baby's development. At St. Joseph, they provide family beds so that both mother and father can stay with their baby after birth. Something that happens when you have your baby close to you at night is that they learn to breathe regularly by being near you. Their heart learns to beat regularly by being next to you. It's called entrainment. Sometimes babies fall out of synchronicity. So when they're with their parents, they have something to remind them. The delivery was this morning at 3, 3 a.m. And you see what I've told you, that we don't get any close. So she, she's just staying like this, staying in con contact, skin to skin. She's feeling safe in the situation. We got many, many studies who show us that the mothers have more sleep, that the mothers feel better, that the mothers are happier. The bedding in or the co-sleeping is very necessary to getting a good start for life. This was a hard fight to uh, give the staff the information that rooming is good for mother and baby. I think when you, when you take a look for the baby, when you understand what happens for the baby, you will understand it couldn't be better to stay out of the room. At St. Joseph, they also encourage parents to co-sleep with their babies after birth 
and to continue this practice even when they go home. You're too big. You will smother the infant. Babies are dying because they were put in an unsafe sleep environment. A new ad campaign will help save infant lives. The new campaign to convince parents to put their babies in a crib. We think it's clear. We don't think that there is any debate. We don't think there is a quote unquote safe way to share a bed with your baby. It is absolutely not true that co-sleeping is inherently dangerous. If that were true, none of us would be here having this conversation. Dr. James McKenna is a professor of the University of Notre Dame and is the world's leading authority on mother-infant co-sleeping. He conducts his research in a sleep lab in the dark. Using only infrared light, the footage shows the love and affection a bed-sharing baby receives at night that is not available to an infant sleeping alone. The only way babies have survived through the millennia and throughout our entire evolution is by virtue of sleeping next to their mothers for breastfeeding. We are a culture that for about 100 years have always thought that co-sleeping with your baby was odd, unusual, and strange. We were and are perhaps the only society in the world for which those thoughts would be acceptable or even considered. There have been several public health campaigns that have shown photographs of newborn babies with a butcher knife in the bed with them. They are not looking at the competence of babies. So what the media is not necessarily distinguishing is safe co-sleeping contexts and situations from unsafe ones. You have to keep in mind that the human infant is born neurologically and developmentally to engage in a co-sleeping environment. In other words, the baby is designed to sleep next to the parent and or the mother, and particularly a breastfeeding mother. Every other culture knows that the closer a mother and baby are and the more time they spend together, the more breastfeeding succeeds, and the more breastfeeding succeeds, the less likely it is that a baby will get sick and that a baby will die. For breastfeeding mothers, uh, co-sleeping next to your baby is incomparable. The closer the baby to the mother, the greater the numbers of breastfeeds, and that, of course, increases mother's milk supply, and it permits mother to manage that milk and her baby and her sleep in a much more uh, comfortable and or efficient way. In the middle of the night, a breastfed baby can smell where the food is, they know where the food is, and they can navigate in the dark and actually latch themselves on without even waking the mother up. It actually creates a high level of competence in a newborn baby. Most of other mothers stay for three or four, five days after the birth in the hospital and getting first information, and then a midwife comes to them. Every mother has the chance to get a midwife for the first 10 weeks. everybody getting problems in the first weeks. When you don't get a specialist who knows that it's normal to get problems at this time, you will stop breastfeeding. Mothers at St. Joseph with premature babies have tremendous support from the doctors and nurses so their babies learn to breastfeed from the very beginning. It's very, very rare that we use formula. We have a lot of people who take care of the mother and of, of her breasts and of giving milk. So normally, we don't have any problem. She came in 30th week, very surprisingly for both of us. Our weight was uh, 980 grams. Katrin came and explained to me, may I touch your breasts, and this is what I'm doing. I'm mm. taking the very first milk. Pumping it first, and then putting it in a little syringe. And um, she had a little uh, feeding tube that went in through her nose. So we had to feed her with a syringe through her nose. Um, and the nurses came in um, and did it the first time. And they showed us how to do it and how fast to press the plunger and just do it gently in stages and this and that. I remember her little head and, and compared to my breast, I thought that'll, that'll never, never work. But then um, yeah. Katrin came over and said, oh, no problem, they have that, that flexible jaw. She opened her mouth and boom, was glued to my breast and I was amazed. Okay. We release babies from the ICU very early, exclusively 
breastfed. Uh, no bottle, no feeding tubes, nothing. And we don't have a certain weight or anything for leaving home. Some babies we, we let go uh, with 1,400 gram. That was the smallest. But for us, it's important. Baby drinks on the breast, uh, gains weight with what the baby is drinking, can control the temperature body temperature and the body temperature they can control the best when they have a lot of skin contact and they don't have any more respiration stops. These babies gain sufficient weight by nursing at their own pace and they evaluate each baby individually based on their own unique set of needs. They have such a profound trust in the baby's ability to breastfeed and in the mother's ability to provide for her baby. Since going baby friendly, the number of women who have chosen to give birth at St. Joseph has increased by 110%. I can't help but think of the many mothers I have worked with in America and how different their experiences could have been if they had been given the same support these mothers have received. A lot of people say, well, we don't want to lay guilt on the, these women. And my read on the literature is that the women who choose not to breastfeed are making a very conscious choice, and they don't feel guilty. It's the women who fail their goals. They're the ones who feel guilty. And they're failing not because of themselves. They're failing because of people or, or institutions like hospitals that don't support these women. Many women in America enter the hospital with every intention to breastfeed, but often it's not that simple. We are in a society that spends a lot of time um, doing the opposite of empowering women. Uh, I think women, in my opinion, go into hospitals feeling like they can't do them this by themselves. They, this is a process that somebody else is in charge of that is done on a doctor's clock. And I think that nursing is very much the same thing. I think that they have their confidence ruined by people saying, oh, you're going to nurse? Good luck with that. Perpetuating this, this cycle of uh, people doubting themselves. The nurses brought the babies. The assumption was that I was to breastfeed. Um, they had, we had a pump at, in my room. And I was instructed to pump every 15 minutes and someone showed me how to use the device and I've never, and just once, and it was something that was very foreign to me. I didn't really know how to use it. We asked to see the lactation consultant, but we were told that it was a weekend and they weren't available until the next day and that we would be low on the priority list because we were nursing well. And I said to the nurses, I don't think he's nursing well. He, he, keeps, he keeps trying to latch and he immediately pulls off and just screams. I wasn't feeling very supported by the lactation staff at the hospital. I was able to start trying with the breastfeeding when he was closer to coming home, I would say. So he was in the NICU for 10 weeks, maybe around the five or six week mark is when we got to that point. It was, you know, about midnight, and the nurse came in and just said, you just squeeze your boob together like this, and you put the baby on. And so I tried that, and I didn't really know if I was doing it right. It didn't feel OK. And within a few hours, um, I was bleeding a lot from my nipples, and it was super painful. When women come home from the hospital, they often struggle even more. When you come home from the hospital with a new baby, it's every single thing is new. Your entire life is turned upside down. And for me to have multiple challenges with breastfeeding on top of just adjusting to new motherhood was just overwhelming to me. He wasn't gaining weight as fast as he was expected to, and that just meant more breast milk, and then that meant more fear and stress and anxiety about whether or not I was going to be able to do this. A woman is very vulnerable at this time in her life. And the slightest word, such as you have flat nipples, 
that in a woman's mind could stop her right from the get-go, thinking that, oh, I don't have what it takes. About six months into nursing, and you know, I had no supply problems at all. My son was thriving, was gaining weight like a champion. And it took one comment from a family member questioning how long my supply would last for my supply to actually dip. It was within two days of someone instilling one little seed of doubt in my mind. I think after about a week of being home, I started really, or maybe a few days, I started really stressing out that this breastfeeding thing wasn't working. So I decided to go to my local uh, breastfeeding support center and the lactation consultant there said that she doesn't know if my milk will ever come in. And she, I mean, she, it was really, it was very traumatic for me. She lifted my boobs up with like, kind of like disgust like this and said, hmm, I don't think your milk's gonna come in. I don't know if it ever will. I was devastated and I, I think I came home and cried and cried and um, that was really hard. Anyway, so then I talked to my friend Megan who said that I should call Jennifer. She came over and it was completely different. She was so encouraging. She brought the little, the little thing, the tube thing that you stick onto the nipple. It feels like the baby's breastfeeding. It just was, uh, really made the difference. And I just, like, when I think about that, like, I feel like if I had Jennifer from the beginning, it would have been totally different, so. I think women are surrounded by a lot more people who are ready to help them fail and allow them to fail than to help them succeed. I originally came to St. Joseph to see the effects of skin to skin in kangaroo care, but I've come away from this experience with something much more profound. It is not just about the hospital's policies. It's about trusting the bond between mother and child. The Berlin Wall, a symbol of a country divided. Mothers, fathers, brothers and sisters, families torn apart. In the United States, are we creating an invisible wall of our own? between mothers and their babies? Sweden had one of the highest breastfeeding rates, so we figured we were close enough. I can tell you that we've already seen women breastfeeding in public all over the place. Historically, Sweden, if you go back to the 60s, from countries outside Sweden, it was seen as a very advanced country where you would see more nudity. It isn't as shocking to see uh, a woman breastfeeding here. We don't have this um, shyness uh, about the breast. Uh, a child who is breastfeeding is a very nice thing to see. It's jätte vanligt att folk ammar utomhus och på restauranger och på kaféer här i Sverige. Det är inte så stor grej för alla gör det och är bebisarna hungriga så måste de få mat. When I first came to Sweden, I was surprised by the rates of breastfeeding here because they are strikingly high. Uh, when I uh, gave birth to my son, Nicholas, uh, that is uh, uh, almost seven years ago, uh, everybody told me, oh, you have to breastfeed. And that was the main, uh, <laughs> main thing. Uh, but then I realized that it's not that easy. I had my mother to ask, and we are five kids, and uh, she has been breastfeeding for like a decade. <laughs> so she, of course, knew how to, how to teach and how to do it. When I first came to Sweden as a researcher, I was kind of shocked of how 
family oriented they were. It's everywhere. Dels så ligger det i vår kultur. Vi har alltid ammat. Våra mammor har ammat oss, våra mormödrar har ammat våra mammor. Och sen så är det lätt för oss att amma också för vi får vara hemma. Staten betalar oss i 18 månader för att stanna hemma med vårt barn. Så det är väldigt lätt. Så det är det absolut lättaste alternativet för oss. In Sweden we are very fortunate because we could stay at home with our kids for such a long time compared to other countries. And that of course makes it easier uh, to breastfeed too. They know that they're going to save money if they encourage breastfeeding in the first six to 24 months of life. You can compare, for example, various societies that invest in the infancy and the mother-child relationship by just giving time off from work, for example, or having maternity leave be something that everybody accepts if they so wish to take it. These things enable the culture to have more stability. You can look around when you are walking here in Stockholm uh, on the street and you will see a lot of men with their small children and they are between six to 12 months and that's fantastic and that has changed a lot. In Sweden, a man who goes back to work rather than take his paid leave is not well regarded in his company. It's so important for the baby to be with their, his parents. If you have to leave your child when it's two months old, it's crazy. It's so sad. There was some pressure for women to go back to work earlier at one stage, a suggestion it would be a good idea for women not to take so much time off work. And the suggestion was well, they could breastfeed using either express milk or formula. The risk is if you're removing that time that mother and baby spend together, even if they're using expressed milk, the baby isn't having that close physical contact with the mother. Professor Scott Montgomery is a leading epidemiology researcher at Karolinska Institute in Sweden. He studies the effects skin to skin has on immunity, obesity, and disease processes later in life. We know from animal studies that rat pups, for example, who don't have physical contact in the first days of their life with the, uh, the mother rat, they tend to develop poorer control of the stress response. The stimulation of skin-to-skin -skin contact for them seems to be critically important. And we suspect the same thing is true for humans. Breastfeeding is an important time of physical contact between mother and baby. The support that mothers and fathers enjoy here in Sweden is incredible. Imagine the differences these pro-family policies would make in America. They encourage bed sharing, they encourage breastfeeding in public. Every mom gets education prenatally about breastfeeding, and then they have total support. We start very early in the pregnancy. We are talking a lot of breastfeeding, it's very natural. If there is any urgent problem or difficulties with the breastfeeding, she can even go to the hospitals here in Stockholm. Uh, nearly all of them have special departments with specialized midwives on breastfeeding. När jag började amma så hade jag lite problem med att amma. Jag hade svårt att få rätt tag, att mitt barn fick rätt tag om bröstet. Så jag fick sår och blåsor och det gjorde väldigt ont. Så kan man ringa och så får man guidning på telefon och så får man komma och träffa en sjuksköterska eller en barnmorska som hjälper en. Och... We think that the woman has enough of milk in the breast. So we don't give any formula to the baby. In the hospital I, I was offered formula. Um, I was offered the luxury of being able to give my baby over to the nurses and have her taken to the nursery and, you know, so that I could sleep through the night and, and they would give her, obviously, formula. When I said, but isn't it so much better to breastfeed? I feel like, well, you know, lots of people use formula. It's fine. That's fine. If you want to do that, you can do that. Um, if you want to breastfeed, we have a pump, we have a lactation consultant. So I 
tried to breastfeed. At some point, I started freaking out. I was totally scared that they were starving to death. <laughs> They're gonna starve. So I gave them some formula, and it was disgusting. But they drank it, and the nipple was really easy to suck because it came out really fast. And um, and so but there was, even though I was disgusted, there was a sigh of relief that they were, I felt like they were at least being fed. It was the middle of the night, and the nurse, I was calling for help um, because my breasts were bleeding and my nipples were really, really sore. It seemed like she was frustrated um, that I needed attention that she wasn't able to devote to me. And she just said, it's probably time for you to just give him formula. One of the things that we found in Sweden was that Sweden values the health of their citizens over businesses. In Sweden, you never receive free formula at the hospital. And as new parents, you never receive free gifts in the mail. The reason that formula is not being marketed in Sweden the same way it is in the United States is because they follow an international code which was written by the World Health Organization in 1981. It specifically states that formula companies should not advertise or give any gifts of formula to pregnant women or mothers with infants under the age of six months. Many countries in the world follow the guidelines of the WHO code. The United States is one of only six countries that does not follow the code. In fact, we shamelessly violate it. In Sweden, I came to my grocery and there was a full shelf with a long thing saying in Swedish and English, for the next X months, this company will not be allowed to sell its products here because it was not respecting the code. I went to a market in Stockholm and found the only formula for infants under six months of age was way down on the bottom shelf. That's it. Look at this whole thing. This is all there is on this shelf. This little tiny bit of formula, guys. I asked the store manager and a clerk and both said that they hardly sell any. We are absolutely not allowed to give any gifts like a formula to the parents to take home with the baby. Women leave the hospital. They get formula in their hands. They take it home. They struggle. It's the first thing they turn to. If formula has to be in a hospital for those rare occasions when it's actually needed, then it shouldn't have a label on it. Why are they promoting a company? Why is a hospital promoting a company's products? This is not appropriate. The babies are in a little bin, and under the bin are two trays, and it's filled with supplies. I left with, you know, a carload of supplies and tons of formula. It wasn't a good feeling going home with all of those samples. It felt like I failed because I needed stuff to do something that was just supposed to be natural. I actually had a number of, of uh, formula companies just, you know, send boxes of samples over. And a frustration I personally have is that, you know, I sort of have become like the de facto spokesperson of the formula feeding community. And I, I would love to be able to talk to the formula companies and tell them like, stop doing what you're doing. They do things like, this is our breastfeeding support line, you know, call if you're having problems or putting ads on, you know, breastfeeding articles. Having it at hospitals, I think it gives it a certain credibility that doctors are validating these, these formulas. And one time I, I asked, I asked one of the nurses if I could see the notepad. And so I started flipping through it and it said what you need to take to the hospital with you uh, when you're delivering what you need to take home with you, what, what you need to have. And at the bottom of the checklist, there was always something, you know, there was the formula brand. Already they were trying to instill this. They were trying to get you to start thinking about it and validating it. If Sweden can enforce the WHO code and it's working, why aren't we doing this in the United States? The formula companies have created a huge insecurity for moms that make them feel like they can't feed their own babies. 
And it's so often very subtle that when we look at how a mom's holding a baby, the baby's tummy up. And when I was a postpartum nurse, the moms would often be very shocked when I would turn the baby in towards their tummy because you can't breastfeed a baby with its tummy up. That's a formula feeding position. What they found is that if they pay lip service to supporting breastfeeding, they can sneak in the back door and get more formula sold. There's a picture of a mom bottle feeding and she's gorgeous. She has white teeth and you see her wedding band and the baby's smiling, you see the baby's face. And the article about breastfeeding has the baby kind of turned away and maybe the mom's looking at the foot and everything's kind of blurry and you don't see her wedding ring and maybe her teeth aren't quite as white. And so your brain sort of registers, oh, Breastfeeding looks a little hard. This is not in the cognitive brain at all. This is in the right brain, and it's going straight to your heart. Newborns are different. Newborns grow at least a quarter inch a week during the first months of life. Vitamin D is a key to this growth. New Enfamil Premium Newborn has 25% more vitamin D intended to help meet the expert recommended daily intake. Baby formula. It's one of the most important choices you make as a parent. There are so many components in human milk that haven't even yet been identified. So there's no way that they could be put into formula. In addition to that, when you place an artificial component in, what we know is that the human body does not utilize it in the same way. Formulas are dead. They don't have live tissue in them. Breast milk is a live tissue. In fact, some researchers refer to it as white blood because it tends to have virtually the same components in it that a mother's blood has. Some of those are being added to formulas now, but they're artificial components. They don't know how much to put into a given formula. Whereas with the breast milk, the baby has exactly what he needs to meet his exquisitely unique genetic profile. They encouraged me to stick with the formula, particularly because he ended up losing too much weight and there was concern that he wasn't getting enough. So I had to give the formula to get everyone to shut up. They encourage you to um, supplement one bottle a day so they will continue to maintain their weight and they're concerned about them getting enough calcium. I feel it's their preference to bottle feed the baby more so because they know how much the baby is getting per day in calories, that they have more control over it. Babies who are getting more jaundice should be looked at closely. They shouldn't be supplemented with formula. Babies whose moms have sore nipples or babies who are gaining weight slowly don't need supplementation. They need extra care. If you can convince parents that their babies are growing too slowly, you can get them to supplement with formula. Growth charts have been around for as long as I've been in pediatrics, and as long as I've seen them, they've been misused. They're printed for free by the formula manufacturers. The millions of dollars these companies make is devoted to marketing, people sitting in boardrooms deciding how they're going to shut down your milk supply. They don't want you to supply milk because if you supply milk, you won't buy their product. So they shut down her manufacturing plant. One and two, finished. That's their first priority. There's no profit to be had in supporting breastfeeding, period. Formula companies, all of them, give medical schools, universities, the American Academy of Pediatrics, tons of money. The entire structure of pediatric care in America has been influenced by formula company money. They have millions and millions of dollars to spend supporting our conferences and to buy us dinners and to fly speakers in and out on legalized bribery. They make sure they are well taken care of. They lobby heavily in the government. They talk to the politicians. The USDA is the one who recommends whether or not WIC will get formula money. What about the Dairy Council? They're all making money from it. One of the reasons we actually have nurseries separate from the mothers in a hospital, formula companies would actually give free architectural services and they designed it so that it would be more difficult to support breastfeeding. They did that on purpose. They did that to create a need 
for their product. We have uh, a lot more babies with allergies. There are chronic illnesses which are on the upswing, uh, including everything from arthritis to diabetes to obesity. Let's not mention the fact that it might destroy your kid's immune system because there's another for-profit industry later that can benefit from that. If you look at a can of formula and you look at the ingredients, you'll see one of the highest ingredients is high fructose corn syrup. They use palm oil and other ingredients that have never been proven beyond a doubt to be safe. 50, 60, 70% of our kids are overweight. The jury is coming in showing us that this is detrimental biophysically, this is detrimental emotionally. We're seeing 10-year-old kids with adult onset diabetes and the reason is that we're teaching them to eat too much early on and then we're continuing this pattern. We're starting to see uh, physical problems two and three generations in to bottle feeding families. Formula feeding is the longest lasting, uncontrolled experiment lacking consent in the history of medicine. Fox 6 reviewed all the medical examiner reports in which babies died in the bed with an adult in 2009 and so far this year. One factor was evident in every single case. Which do you think it was? The adult had been drinking, there were other children in the bed, the baby was formula fed, or the adult and baby were sleeping on a sofa. All the babies were formula fed. Formula fed babies will sleep longer because their stomachs stay full. Formula empties from your stomach incredibly slowly. It's like having a rock in your stomach. Babies are supposed to wake up, they're supposed to touch base, they're supposed to eat and get an elevated blood sugar, they're supposed to be synchronized to a mother's heartbeat and a mother's respiratory pattern. There is a whole behavioral and physical reconnection between the mother and baby when breastfeeding is occurring that just does not show up when the mother and baby are bottle feeding. What would parents do if they found out that in America, twice as many babies die within the first year of life than in Sweden. Why is the U.S. allowing this to happen? I decided it was time to go home and help transform America. Thank you for calling Nestle Nutrition. Thank you for calling. Thank you for calling. We are proud that Enfamil is the number one infant formula brand recommended by pediatricians. Yes, hi. My name is Jennifer Davidson. Um, I would like to speak to someone, head of public affairs. I'm doing a documentary on breastfeeding in America. Okay. Uh, I'm actually jumping in a cab. Do you mind? Send me an email with um, your request, and I can relay it to the appropriate person. Yeah, so who would that appropriate person be? Uh, you can send it to my email, I'll get it to the right person. The sophisticated psychological warfare that they actually wage on a mother is non-stop. It's constant, and as I say, that's their job. You know, we need to expect that, but help protect mothers from it. We need consumers to be speaking to these people and saying enough is enough, and we are your customer base. Like, because maybe they're not gonna listen if it's not affecting their bottom line, but we are their bottom line. And they need to hear, you know, we want better quality ingredients. We want this option, that option. We want no GMO. There's so much information out there. There is the other side, it's just not you know, commercially sponsored, so it's not as widely available, it's not as slick a lot of times, you know, it's not as packaged and, and, and put in front of you. There's a bigger picture than what we see in the media. So in the end, it's up to us to be able to distinguish between a good marketing campaign 
and the ability to trust our instincts. We need to help women to succeed. And one way of doing this is to change the laws and encourage businesses to implement family-friendly policies. I think that it needs to be institutionalized somehow that that moms get support, you know, that it's not just three weeks off and, and get back to work. If we had a month of paid leave for fathers and six months for mothers, that would be absolutely incredible compared to what we do have. There are uh, advantages to supporting an employed mother to breastfeed, which includes increased retention, productivity, as well as reduced health care costs and absenteeism. We're here to support however you choose to feed your baby. But if you've got eight out of 10 moms discharged in Los Angeles that are choosing to breastfeed, you better be ready to support those women. And as women, we need to support each other. My main intention would always be to support someone from their B to their C. So if, you know, breastfeeding is in their wheelhouse and they're up for the conversation, I'd say, go for it. You know, you can do it. But if it's really a distant conversation, then I just want to support them to get to their next place. It's very helpful to have someone who can move your elbow a little bit, give you reassurance, supply what otherwise might have been supplied by cultural support and by the fact that everybody around you is breastfeeding. Tanzania, my country, has many tribes. One of the tribes is the Shambhala people, which is my tribe. When the women have babies, they stay indoors, taken care of, pampered for 30 days. Mothers should stick together. If you have that support from other women and from the husbands as well, that this is the best thing for our young to breastfeed. Community, really, is what we need. Because I'm a single mom, I didn't have, I didn't have support from a husband or a partner, but I had enormous support from my friends, and we formed a mommy group that is still going strong to this day. One really beautiful way for mothers to support one another is mother-to-mother -mother milk sharing. Babies who really need milk should have banked milk. And this should become more of a, um, a product which is much more easily accessible. I found this website called Milk Shares, and they match mothers who have too much milk with mothers who don't have any milk or need milk. And so I found this wonderful woman who just had a whole freezer full of milk. So I supplemented my twins with her breast milk until they were about almost 11 months old. And so I really was able to stay off the formula. My takeaway from donating milk to another family was amazing. It made me feel like I was helping another family, like I was being part of the village that everybody wants when they have a kid. It opens a door for you to have a connection to another mother, which is something you will not regret. I would do it again in a heartbeat. It was, it was a really rewarding, awesome experience. Most of what I learned, I learned from parents. And I watched moms uh, feed their babies. I watched babies grow at different rates. I watched mothers do this with different styles. And I learned that mothers know their babies a lot better than I do. My real job is just to get out of the way and support a woman as she discovers her own ability. So much of that first stage of development, in my opinion, is about not feeling that I exist and not feeling that I trust life or that my needs are going to be met. And then all the other stages of development build on that one. So I just feel like offering that to the planet would be the greatest gift. We're trying to come at solving the world's problems from the symptomatic stuff back. But I think it would be so much easier to start from the beginning and work up. I think the American model is basically fascinating, but it's no longer pertinent to the modern age. How do we build a society which nurtures breastfeeding as part of a larger concept of attachment? We've got to build cities where we actually live together, live together. At times I feel like I'm fighting a losing battle, but I'm not going to stop fighting, because if we quit fighting, babies suffer. It's, it's very simple. 
society needs to recognize that and say we want to invest in the health and long-term health care of our children, and that means supporting their mothers. I think if you're part of a society that knows what birth looks like, knows what feeding a baby looks like, and supports that, then that will lead to higher rates of breastfeeding. If we can affect the media, if we can affect policy, and just overall what, what, what messages little girls and women are taught, then we can affect a change culturally. It is one step at a time, and it's about awareness, and it's about changing the story around being a mother. I can't help but wonder if the image of the lactating breast was normalized, more normalized, more visible, if we somehow couldn't bring these two sides of ourselves back together. This idea that we were nursing mothers, but we were also sexual beings. We need to see it. If we don't see it, then it, it doesn't become normal. <laughs> we need to normalize it. We need to get out there and breastfeed our babies, not hide away in cars or at home. We have things to do. <laughs> a movement. We need to get excited. We need to change things. This has to change. Women need to stand up for their human rights. The biological mandates are clear. Let's reverse the trend. Let's turn the corner and go back to a culture that loves and nurtures its future generations. Let's protect our future. Never separate a mother and baby. It teaches intimacy, it teaches connection, it teaches care. I think these are huge voids in society in general. So. We are the living embodiment of it, not only in the doing of it, but in the offering of it directly to microcosmically to a little one. You know, they have that in their back pocket now. It's not just her getting it from me, I'm getting it from her as well. And it made me feel very powerful, like I had some kind of superpower, like this was magic. It is the most extraordinary thing that has ever happened. I was keeping this little being alive. It made me feel even more empowered than I already did. We are able to sustain the life of another human being with our own milk. Cradled in the comfort of a mother's arms, a baby is at home. Honoring this nursing relationship secures the future health of America and the well-being of every mother and child. As many drops of water as it fill the ocean, I will love you. As many 
grains of sand does it build the land I love you as many dries as 